So today we're leading off with the right way to ask for feedback. Why is this so vital? Why are we teaching on this today? Because if you're not getting consistent feedback and then the right feedback in a consistent manner, I've got news for you. You're flying blind. It's just that simple. Uh, you, you might feel like, well, Ken, I'm in a great place of clarity now. Yeah, but you continue to move forward and you're not getting feedback on a consistent basis and the right kind of feedback, then I'm telling you, you're falling behind. You're going to wake up one day and you're going to be completely lost and you're going to go, I never saw it coming. That's right. You didn't because you aren't getting feedback. Feedback is the food of champions. Can I just tell you that? Feedback is the food of champions. We have entrepreneurs, creatives, leaders, workers. This is true in our relational life as well. And if we aren't getting feedback before we make a big change uh, or just as a tool for self-evaluation and personal growth, then I'm telling you, it's going to crush you. And it's unnecessary failure. It's unnecessary frustration. Because if you're just getting feedback, you can avoid so much failure and so much frustration. So let's break this down. I want you to begin to get in a habit, which will then turn into this unbelievable growth practice. See, a habit's good, but then this habit is going to yield so much goodness. And here's what I want you to do. Two things. Seek out good feedback. Eliminate bad feedback. Oh, man. That's so good. I, I hope you don't miss that. In its simplicity, I want you to begin to seek out good feedback, and I want you to eliminate bad feedback. I want you to seek out good feedback. I want you to eliminate bad feedback. So let's talk about good feedback. How do we go about getting feedback the right way? How do we ask the right way? What are we asking? Who are we asking? That's what we're going to break down. So now it's important to understand that not all feedback is created equal. <laughs> I mean, if you're not careful, if you're out there asking the wrong question, you're asking the wrong people, can I just tell you something? You're getting really bad feedback, and that's going to be harmful. Remember, we're talking about the right feedback. I wrote about this in my very first book, One Question, and I wrote it this way, and it's a handlebar for many of you. And here it is. The right question asked of the wrong person is still the wrong question. Think about that. The right question, if you ask the right question, you know what you're trying to learn, you know why you're trying to learn it, and you ask in order to learn, but you ask of the wrong person, it's still the wrong question. It's the wrong question because you asked it to the wrong person. It's so vitally important that we ask the right people. So, number one, I want to get rid of naysayers. Now, some of you are going, no, wait a second, I want someone who's going to tell me no. If they, no, no, no. Naysayers are negative. It doesn't matter what you ask them, how you ask them, when you ask them, it's going to be negative. That's not helpful. I want truth tellers. So get out the naysayers and bring in the truth tellers. And a truth teller, if it's a nay, they'll tell you it's a nay. But if it's a yay, they'll tell you it's a yay. Understand that you got to get rid of people that are just ultimately negative and it doesn't matter what you throw at them. And I want you to get in people that are truth tellers. Now, within the truth tellers, okay, so let's just use some simple numbers. You want to get some feedback on a very important issue, whether it's relational or professional. We want to get rid of people that you just know are negative, negative, negative. And we go, okay, let's get some people that are truth tellers and they'll tell me the truth if it's hard. They'll tell me the truth if it's easy. They're going to tell me the truth. Now, within the truth teller category, and let's say we want to seek out five truth tellers just for an easy round number, okay? I want five different types of truth tellers. I, I want them to have a different life experience. I want them to have a different context. I want them to have different knowledge. That's what we're looking for here. All truth tellers, but I want each of the five to be different so that you are getting a range 
of honest opinions. Remember, just because they're being honest doesn't mean they're giving you the best advice. This is the key here. So when I get, and again, I'm using five as a round number, you can go as high as you want to go. Think of it as a bucket. I, I am out looking for truth tellers who have relevant, sometimes non-relevant experience, who have a different life journey, who because of that life journey, the experiences and their wisdom are different. And so I'm getting all those opinions. Think of it like a bucket, picking up seashells. And I, I'm getting good seashells and I'm putting them in the bucket. And then I take those home and I dump them out on the table and I begin to look at all of the different feedback. Because the sources matter. And so if I've got, well, one thing here that says maybe this is, they were saying it's, 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 it's maybe a little too much risk. But this person said they didn't think there was much risk at all. This person said, this is an absolute no-brainer. That's what I'm talking about. If we stay inside this little metaphor of the seashells and we put this all out on the table, we go, okay, all right, why did this person say it was too risky? This, why did this person say, eh, it was just a little bit of risk? Why did this person go, oh, it's a no-brainer, jump? Why? We got to look at that because all of that matters. And so there might be two or three people in that bucket, right, who their feedback aligns more with your worldview and so this is the point of considering the source, even the good sources, because we're only talking about good sources of feedback. Even then, we want to consider their unique background, their unique experience, uh, the way they see the world, their age, the, the, the industry they're in, all of that matters. And so I, I hope you understand that this is taking a very complex, sometimes confusing and sometimes uh, even intimidating process of, I want to get some feedback. I want to get counsel. There's, there's wisdom in counsel. Well, this process I hope unpacks for you a very simple way for you to go, okay, I've got all this different feedback. I now have a process and here's what happens. The first time you do this, and then the second time, the third time, before the, as you do this, this becomes more intuitive for you and instinctive. And I love the idea of varying opinions. And I'll tell you what really gets exciting as you begin to do this process is when you begin to see that one person who has a very similar experience or maybe background agrees with you and you go, wait a second, I was thinking that because of this. I can see it objectively now by looking at their lens and looking at why they have the lens that they have. All right, don't go anywhere. Coming up in the news, Jordan Lee Dooley joins me live. Coming up. According to Glassdoor, the average job offer attracts over 250 applicants. So if you've made it to the interview, you've already made a great impression. So now is your time to showcase how you are the best choice for this role. That's why we created How to Win the Interview. This free guide will walk you through the five strategies to help you stand out amongst the competition. With just a little intentionality, you can prepare yourself to win the interview. To get it, go to kencoleman.com slash interview. All right, folks, welcome back to the Ken Coleman Show, where we help you win at work so you can win at life. I want to help you make more money and experience more meaning. I want to raise that income and help you raise your impact. Come on, come on, come on. 844-747-2577 if you want to jump in with a comment or a question. Uh, did you know, speaking of this global economy and then where we are in this hot job market in the United States, that project management, if you're a project manager, boy, the future is very bright. Or if you want to become a project manager, the future is bright. How bright? Uh, economists are expecting project management, the field, the skill set, the career path to grow by 33% by 2027. So that's why we're excited here at Ramsey Solutions to announce that we've opened up applications for our first ever Project Management 101 course. Yours truly is one of the professors. Mm, I feel I need I need an ascot all of a sudden. No, I kid. Uh, it's a lot of fun. I'll be joining our chief technology officer, Brendan Wojko, here at Ramsey Solutions. He leads, hires, 
uh, all of our project managers here at Ramsey Solutions. So spots are limited. Don't wait to apply for the course. Go to RamseySolutions.com slash project. RamseySolutions.com slash project. It's going to be fun, fun, fun. All right. A uh, couple of stories to get to today. I'm a man of the people, keeping you informed, keeping you equipped, inspiring you to handle change. Let's go. It's time for In the News. Uh, all right, folks, up to the minute uh, information here on where the hottest sectors of the job economy are as it relates to new jobs being added. So we got the latest jobs report and uh, for January. And can I just tell you, even the most bullish, exciting people like me were shocked by the number. Over 400,000 jobs added in the month of January. In fact, it was 400. In fact, it was over 450. I'm sorry. Over 450,000 jobs. Uh, and so here's what I want to do. I want to quickly give you where they are. Now, for some of you, you're going to go, eh, it's under. But some of you are looking for a side hustle. Some of you are in a tough situation financially and you're looking for that second job just to get out of debt or save some money or deal with some medical debt. Some of you are looking for that, as I said, a side hustle that's kind of in an industry that maybe you can get paid to learn how to do it. All right. And some of you are going, I know the industry I want to be in and maybe one of these hits you. Okay. So we're just going to break this down. Um, of the 450,000 new jobs that were posted, added, in the month of January, uh, 151,000 of them were in leisure and hospitality. Okay, so your hotels, your restaurants, um, general tourist type sites. Now, now, aside from just you getting a job, let me tell you why this is good news. This is a direct result of states that have been largely locked down or under stronger COVID restrictions, rate lifting the restrictions. So like give an example, New Jersey, their governor came out last week today. We're, we're we're lifting all restrictions. New York's governor, a couple days later, we're lifting restrictions. This is going to be good for restaurant owners. And can we just say, yay, I can go to New York again and go eat? So you're going to see a lot of this because let's just focus for a moment on the fact that in the COVID pandemic shutdown, two areas were hit. Two, let's talk about an area and then a group of people. The leisure and hospitality region, or excuse me, area of the economy was crushed. Broken dreams. I mean, people had to shut down their lifelong dream of owning restaurants or a restaurant. It was hit really hard. And then the people that worked in those restaurants or hotels hourly wage earners were also disproportionately affected with layoffs or just being let go period you know fired and there's no furloughs just, you're gone and we're not laying you off bringing you back like we're shutting the doors we're done this was the fact so this is really great news for a multitude of reasons now the second uh, largest area is just in your business area so small business corporations 86,000 jobs retail trade Wow, 61,000 of the 450,000 were in the retail space. Again, another area that was hit really hard. Brick and mortar retail stores, because of foot traffic being down, went out of business at alarming rates. Workers displaced big time in that space. Really good to see retail jobs opening up. Uh, transportation and warehousing, 54,000 jobs. And I'll just leave it there. The rest are, are much smaller. Um, transportation and warehousing. This is another good sign. Uh, deep down in the jobs report, 7,500 truckers were hired. Now, I want to say six, eight weeks ago, we reported on this show in this segment that there was a need in the United States for 80,000 truck drivers and folks, this is real. This is hitting you where you are. If you're watching or listening in a part of the country where the grocery sell shelves are bare, oh, this is what's going on. Now, I got to say, quick survey in the uh, control room. Are you guys seeing uh, empty grocery shelves where you guys shop and live? Yes. You seeing that? Nathan's not. Joe is. Okay. I've seen spotty places in Middle Tennessee, but it's being reported that you can't even get what you want. And we're not talking about toilet paper anymore. 
you know? Uh, we're talking about everything from peanut butter to, you know, your basic lunch stuff. So all that said, to see jobs being added in manufacturing and transportation is very good. Okay, next story. Uh, boy, this is interesting. CNN, one reason people hate this current economy, despite the low unemployment numbers, is a return of the misery index. Okay, so some of you are going, what? Is this a thing? It really is. The misery index is a, uh, it's a very simple way of kind of measuring how people feel about the economy. And it's a political tool. If we're being completely transparent, this was a political tool uh, that was created by Lyndon Johnson's top economic advisor. And so then it began to kind of pick up steam in the 70s and 80s. And now it's kind of part of the, the, the mainstream media pays attention to this. Economists pay attention to this. And I'm introducing it to you. But it's really interesting. It measures two areas of economic pain for consumers. One is the unemployment rate. The second one is inflation. Okay. And right now, the misery index is at an 11, which is as high as it's been, okay, since the Great Recession in late 2009, where unemployment was 10.2%. Now, you don't include the unemployment numbers from COVID because those spiked really artificially and then precipitously dropped. And we are quickly moving towards unemployment in the 3% range, which will be unbelievably low, lower than what it was pre-pandemic in 2019, which it was historically low then. So what's going on now? We have a mirror of what was going on after 2009, the Great Recession, or a part of 2009, where we had high unemployment and really low inflation. Now we have extremely low unemployment and inflation is out of control. I mean, it's really rising up at a, a concerning level. Let's put it that way. So even though jobs are abundant, 11 million jobs available, and you can get a raise, you know what's really going on? Why is the misery index up? I'm going to tell you why. Because you're paying a whole lot more for your combo meal at Burger King, Joe. Your groceries. Your groceries have jumped significantly the night out with the with the lady it's expensive i mean if you look at everything everything's up and so here's what people are going well i'm glad i'm un i'm glad i'm employed i'm glad i got a job but my goodness i feel like i'm getting price gouged on the spaghettios and think about this you want to look at one of the largest areas Outside of housing and transportation that's in a family budget, it's groceries. It's groceries. So the misery index is high. We'll see what happens on inflation. All right. Don't go anywhere. Coming up next, we get to your calls. Don't forget later, best-selling author Jordan Lee Dooley joins me live here in the studio. This is The Ken Coleman Show. Do you know what you were born to do? In order to get hired at a job you love, you need to get clear on your talent, passion, and mission. That's why our team created the Career Clarity Guide. In just a few minutes, this free tool will walk you through a process to discover what you do best, talent, the work you love to do, passion, and the results you want your work to produce. That's mission. Then you're gonna feel way more confident throughout the job search process. To get started, go now to kencoleman.com slash clarity. All right, folks, welcome back to the Kent Coleman Show. We're helping you make more money and experience more meaning in your work. Think about how much time you spend at work in your life. It shouldn't just be a good job. It shouldn't be boring. It shouldn't be awful, right? So we're here to help you do that. We want you to win at work because if you're winning at work, you can help you win in other areas of your life. You know that and I know that. There's been a lot of buzz lately. I don't know if you've heard it. I've been talking about it here on the show about Phil from ZipRecruiter. But a lot of thank you, Phil's. 
circulating around the internet. Here's what some people are saying. Liliana G said, super thankful for Phil at ZipRecruiter. He made my whole job search easier and he helped me land a job. That Phil sounds like someone you should want in your corner, especially for an easier job search. I got good news. Phil will help you discover and get a great job. Find out how he does it at ZipRecruiter.com. That's ZipRecruiter.com. All right, to the phones we go, 844-747-2577. Nick joins us in Indianapolis, Indiana. Nick, you're on the Ken Coleman Show. Hey, Ken, how are you doing? I'm living the dream, Nick. What are you doing? Well, I'm in a little bit of a situation. Okay. Um, my current job no longer fulfills me. You know, I'm no longer excited to really do any part of it. Um, and I think I need to leave the company to find that satisfaction. But one, I don't know where to start. I don't know what else I should even pursue. So my question is, how do I go about attacking this problem with success? Okay, great question. First thing we have to do is get clear. Anybody who's not sure which way they want to go, we start with stage one of the seven stages that I wrote about in my book, From Paycheck to Purpose. Okay, get clear. So what is it that you want to do? Do you have notions, ideas? I just believe you do. You've wondered about this at some point. What is the kind of work that you feel would be fulfilling if you were to remove any hurdles and I could just wave my Ken Coleman show pencil in the air and go poof? What are we talking about? Well, that's that's what that's the that's the big question. And I, I honestly I've I've really struggled to pinpoint one thing. Got it. Um, so I really So let me interrupt you. This is good because I've heard mm -hmm. this answer before. I'm interrupting you on purpose. Not to be rude. Yeah. I'm not worried about pinpoint. That's where you're getting hung up. You're getting stuck on the super particulars. And I think that's what's hanging you up. But you did say there's several things or a few things. Tell me the few things. Um, I, I really enjoy creating things. Um, I've what always things? Been, well. Come on. Come on. Say it. You're yeah, proud of well, it. I will say, I, it's like, it's just like little hobbies here. Like I really enjoy making music, nothing too like, you know, professional or put together, but it's just like something that I enjoy to do in my free time. Okay. What else? Um, I really enjoy being outside. I've always, uh, just enjoyed, that's kind of where I find a lot of freedom in my mind is just being outside and hiking and stuff like that. Okay. Um, I enjoy working with my, like making things with my hands. Now um, we're getting up, somewhere. I always kind of liked to do what did you find work? yourself so yard work i was gonna i was gonna ask you was it mm -hmm. a function of putting things in order and making things neat with your hands or was it building something or fixing something sounds like the yard work is one thing was there any kind of fixing or designing or building with your hands um i i took a a, a wood shop class in high school that i really enjoyed and that kind of has always stuck with me Okay. So these um, are the, is this what we mean when you say you've got several ideas you think about? You're not trying to be a professional yeah. musician. You gave me a hobby first. That's fine. Right. That just speaks to and confirms that you're a creative person. That's great. That's a clue. But we're not going to try to be a professional musician. So right. here's the deal. I want you to answer this without any fear. I want you to answer this without a plan. I'll help you on the plan. What would you do tomorrow, Nick? You would try it first. If I guaranteed you'd be successful at it. Okay. And you, you didn't have to commit to it for the rest of your life. What would be the first thing you would try knowing that you've always loved and always been kind of magnetically pulled to working in some way with your hands, either creatively to invent or create something, build something or to fix? What would you try, Nick? Tell me. Oh, Ken, this is the question that I've been asking myself all the time. It I literally struggle to, no. to find that. No, that's, that's not true. I'm... No, that's not true. When I asked you that, you had thoughts go through your head, yes or no? Uh, I had thoughts of what should I, what do I say, but okay. actually finding that, that. I didn't ask that you to find that. it. I asked you, what would you try for fun? If I could pay you well and you were working outside and working with your hands, what would you try? Give me an idea. We're brainstorming. You're, you're thinking yeah, yeah. too hard. Just, I agree. Just talk. I agree. Just feel. Stop thinking. Nick, I'm going to ask you again, and I'm going to tell you right now, I know this because I've done it. There are things that have been popping in your head and you're afraid to say it because you think you got to say it in a perfect way, and you think you got to know that you know that you know, and you don't. Nick, 
What would you try tomorrow if I paid you a good hourly rate, a good salary, you were outside, and you got to work with your hands? What would you try, Nick? I think I would try a building, like like when I took that woodshop class, I think I would want to do that. Yeah. I think I would really enjoy building yeah. um, like tables or anything, really, something yeah. like that. Let me, let me ask you, Nick, do you think that popped in your head because you know you're good at working with wood and hands and tools? No, I would probably be terrible at it right now, honestly. No. Gosh, you're so <laughs> tough on yourself. You are really need, hard I, I on need, yourself. I would need to work on it for sure. <laughs> I know that, but you go back to the woodshop class. Were you awful at it? Mm -hmm. or no. Were you, no, you weren't. So why I made don't you a coffee table I still use today, so Okay. <laughs> well then why don't you stop being mean to my friend Nick? <laughs> no, I'm serious. Who said yeah. something to you? Who did something to you that makes I, you I mean, doubt yourself? Growing up it's it was always a matter of we didn't have a lot of money growing up, so I always felt I needed to do something that was secure and could no matter what No nah, deeper than that. For me. Deeper than that. You your natural default answer is i'm not good enough mm -hmm. that's what you said you said oh i'm not good enough right now i didn't say you had to be a master wood craftsman do you think i was good the first time i did the ken coleman show honestly do you think i was good probably not no i wasn't <laughs> so get over that there's something going on with you that makes you lack self-confidence true or false very true what is it i want you to own it I'm not talking career right now. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to your heart. You don't have to mm -hmm. bear your entire soul. Tell me, why do you lack self-confidence? Not having, I guess, reinforcement to do the things that I actually wanted to do growing up, no matter what it was, like, yeah. career or anything. Just you didn't have general, any, not. yeah, you just didn't have anybody going, I believe in you, Nick. I know you can do it. I know you can dream. Am I right? Right. I wonder if the fact that you grew up in, I don't know if it was poverty level or you grew up in a poor or just not much. I wonder if you took from that, that you didn't have any control over that. And thus you would probably never go any further than the people you saw the adults in your life. Is that possible? I think it's possible. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So here's the deal. I'm going to give you two resources and I want you to engage with them. Will you promise me that you'll do it? Yes. Because you're not paying for it. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be really angry if I ever meet you in this big wide world and you don't use these resources. Number one, I'm going to give you the Get Clear Career Assessment. It's a 20-minute assessment, and it's going to reveal to you some things that you have a hard time saying about yourself, what you're really good at, which is talent, the things you do well, what you love to do, the kind of work that just generally speaking, you get excited about, you love it when you do it. And then three, the results that you want to contribute to this world. It's going to fill out a purpose statement. And then I want you to read the book, The Companion, From Paycheck to Purpose, which shows you the seven stages that will lead you to doing work you love where you can make great money and make great impact. If you will promise me that you'll engage with them, I'm going to give them to you. What's the answer? I promise. All right, my man. We've already got enough clues. You need to be working with your hands. You need to be spending a good part of your day working with your hands outside. All right? So that's what I want you to get diving into. And when you get your purpose statement, I want you to think of it as a 30,000-foot job description. And you begin to look into the areas that you know you've always enjoyed and go after it. But more importantly, Nick, I want you to believe in yourself because you have so much to offer. You have so much to offer. All right, don't go anywhere. More of your calls. And don't forget, Jordan Lee Dooley joins me live. You were created to fill a unique role in and through your work. Now, some of you may be going, I have no idea what that is. Some of you may be saying, I know what I want to do, but I don't know how to get there. I felt all of those emotions. I've been where you are, and I can tell you, there's hope. That's why I wrote the book, From Paycheck to Purpose. You can make the income you want and the impact that you desire. And I know that you have what it takes.
right, folks, welcome back to the Ken Coleman Show. We're helping you make a bunch of money, but also experience a bunch of meaning. I want to increase your income and your impact. You spend way too much time at work not to see a contribution that connects to who you are uniquely, because in your uniqueness lies your greatness. 844-747-2577. One of my colleagues in this great quest to help people is Jordan Lee Dooley, best-selling author, wildly popular host of uh, the She Podcast. She joins me live in our next two segments for our listening audience. You'll have to move over to the video channels to see both segments. That's coming up. It's going to be great. But let's get back to the phones. Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Silas joins us there. Silas, you're on the Ken Coleman Show. Hey, Ken. Thank you so much for taking my call. You bet. What's up? Well, um, I'm 22 I got married about in 2020, so I am married. And oh boy. <laughs> thank you. I uh, I was offered a team lead position at my current part time job, which is, which is a big box retailer. Okay. And I'm currently pursuing a business uh, finance degree, a bachelor's degree. And I'm just wondering, should I take the job or continue? Um, continue with my degree path. Yeah. Okay. So why did we pursue the degree, the, the degree? Where were we thinking we wanted to end up? Do you have a pretty good idea of that professional pinnacle, what that looks like? Um, originally when I started that, I thought maybe I'd want to be an accountant. And after taking some uh, accounting class, I, I didn't love it. I think mm-hmm. I enjoyed the finance side of like personal finance with myself and my wife, I like doing, it's fun to do your budget and sure. save for things, but, uh, I didn't enjoy that. So yeah. I thought, well, you know, I looked financial advisor. I just wasn't sure, maybe a little intimidated by that. All right. And, so let me ask you this because our yeah, time sure. is short. As you sit yeah, here sure. today, do you feel like this degree is leading you where you want to go that you absolutely know. I have a two part question when we decide on college. It's actually really simple. Okay. All right. So here's what I'm asking you is college, your degree that you're pursuing right now. Is it the only way to get where you want to go? Yes or no? No. Is it the best so. way to get where you want to go? Yes or no? Be honest. Ah, uh, see, I'm, you started thinking, I'm not, say it. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, you're not sure leaning towards yes or no? Probably no. No, oh, there's the truth. How many? How much time you got left? Well, how far into this degree are you? I am, so this this May I will have completed my uh, sophomore year. So starting in August, I'll be going as a junior. So two more years. Two more years, yeah. Two halfway. more years of time, two more years <laughs> of money. And let me ask the really the million dollar question. This job offer, does it move you up the ladder that you want to be climbing? I'm not sure. It's good for pay, but I, I'm just not sure if I want to. Uh, yeah, I feel like it would be, my gut feeling is it would be good for me and my wife short term. Okay. Like, it, then it, like we'd be able to start saving for some other things. Great. Before okay. They come, so like, let me interrupt kids. you. So let me interrupt you. Yes, sir. If it's good for you in the short term. It's going to give you some experience, going to give you some leadership experience. True or false? That's true. It's going to give you more money. True or false? True. And we know that college, people are going to freak out when I say this if you're new to the program, <laughs> that college is not the best way for you, right? I'm feeling like it isn't right now. Then stop the degree, take the job in the short term. And then I'm going to give you my assessment to get clear career assessment. I'm going to give you my book from Paycheck to Purpose, which is you've got one is helping you identify your professional pinnacle. That's the assessment. And the book is the guide to climb the mountain. I'm going to give you those two resources. But in the short term, let's take the gig. It's more money and good experience that's transferable once we really figure out what it is you want to do. Do you understand that? I do. All right. Then let's say no more college. Why would you spend money and time on something that doesn't advance the ball down the field? I'm not anti-education, but I'm anti-wasting time and money. For heaven's sakes. He just needed permission. And we've got to start asking the question, 
people and parents. Is college the only way? Is it the best way? If the answer is no, move on. And great news, there's better options. All right, coming up next, the author of the new book, Embrace Your Almost, Jordan Lee Dooley joins me. You're going to love this. Don't move. She's live in studio next. Are you wondering if you should leave your current job or stay put? Well, you're not alone. That's why we created the Should I Quit My Job quiz. In just five minutes or less, this quiz will help you determine if you're at the right company and if you're in the right role. And if you need to make a move, you'll get practical steps to keep you moving forward. Folks, it's time to get unstuck. Life is too short not to do what you were created to do. Go take the quiz right now at kencoleman.com slash quiz. All right, folks, welcome back to the Ken Coleman Show. Joining me in studio, my newish friend, a couple years, but she's an absolute delight. And you want to talk about somebody who uh, understands the mission of this show, who has lived it out and is helping so many people. She is Jordan Lee Dooley. Jordan! <laughs> Welcome. It's so fun to be here. I feel like we've been talking about doing this for so long, we have. and now we are finally we here. We finally <laughs> made it work. Well, you have a busy schedule. Well, you do too. I know. And it's you like... live in you live in Indiana. I live in Tennessee. I mean, it's mm-hmm. not easy to do. Yeah. So it's, it's so exciting to have you with us. Yeah. Uh, the new book, we're going to talk about it a little bit. We'll talk about it more later, Embrace Your Almost. Uh, the subtitle, Find Clarity and Contentment in the In-Betweens, the Not-Quites and the Unknowns. Mm-hmm. And boy, oh boy, when we talk about you know, this, this show, we talk about people who are trying to either figure out what that unique contribution looks like, but then once you figure it out, it's the journey Mm -hmm. itself. Boy, I feel like this is, this is so relevant. So I just want to ask you to, let's start off by just let you drop some personal experience and wisdom on folks who they're not there yet. Mm -hmm. And the theme of this book is of course, you you almost got there and you will unpack some of that, but they're not even, they're just still on that journey and they're going, I don't know if I'm ever going to get there. What would you say to them? Well, I think first I would say define there Mm. because I think we have this idea that like when I get here, I'll be successful. When I get here, I'll be happy. And while there may be some degree of truth that you may be more fulfilled Mm -hmm. when you get to the next level or that when you get clarity or whatever, um, I think we have this general idea that that's where it's all going to come from. And a large theme of the book and just honestly, my lived experience too is can we find contentment in the middle yes. before we get there? Because it's going to make there so much better, whatever that ends up being. Yeah, it's really true. You and I, uh, we have very, it would, age different is, is, is there, obviously. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to tell you, you know, <laughs> she's very young compared to me. You all know I'm the middle age guy, but <laughs> you and I both accomplished something that a lot of people I think would like to accomplish. And I'm just curious. I remember when I first, when, when the proximity principle hit number one on the bestseller list, that was not something I expected. Mm -hmm. I was just hoping and praying the bestseller list happened. But after the initial excitement, I remember I was out in Oregon, Mm. last day of book tour Mm. by myself in the hotels early morning. And I remember after the initial thankfulness and excitement, I was sitting there and I looked in the mirror and I was like, huh, I've worked really, really hard for this to be one of the outcomes. But the reality is my life hasn't changed. I'm not different. Did you experience that as well? Because you've had crazy success with your first book. Yeah. I mean, it's funny because you kind of, like I said, you have this idea once it hits this level or once I do this and there is this level of satisfaction or joy or whatever that comes with it. But yeah, you're still the same you. And it's just, um, there's a gratitude, there's a joy. But yes, I do think I remember waking up and I was like, Okay, so like the world didn't suddenly become more colorful, you know, and that's why I think it's like, okay, we've got to learn to make the most of the journey itself because otherwise we miss the message. Yeah, we miss that. Like, like I think we forget there are aspects of our life, even when we're not quite where we want to be or where we think we should be. There's aspects of our life that others would love to have in so many situations. And so it's just embracing the middle too. Do you think that we somehow as humans and our humanness and our psychology that we confuse contentment, the word that you just challenged us with, mm-hmm. with complacency? A hundred percent. I actually break like, that down. I want to break this down because this is something that I've had to learn the hard way in various different seasons of life, both in life and work. Um, I think complacency is passive. Mm-hmm. Okay. So let's say you're trying to climb the mountain and where you want to get to is the dream job or mm-hmm. the family or the whatever goal you have in your life. And complacency is, it's gotten a little hard. 
it's not quite happened or worked out the way that I thought and the way that I wanted. So I'm going to sit down. I'm done. This sucks. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what complacency looks like. Contentment is active. It is actively choosing to, it doesn't mean you stop walking the direction you want to walk. It doesn't mean you stop pursuing the thing you want to pursue. It just means that you are actively making the most of the journey that you are on. It's stopping and talking to the guy that's walking next to you. It's noticing what's on the side of the road. It's enjoying a nice lunch, you know, taking a break and then continuing on your journey. But contentment or contentment is active while complacency is really passive and it's just sitting down. Why do we have a hard time understanding that contentment is active? I think because, I mean, probably honestly, from a lot of the misunderstandings around the word and the the definitions that are, I think we've been, I don't know, maybe kind of accustomed to thinking that it means, well, you just have to be where you are, which is true. There's an element of being present to it, but you can be present and, Mm. and active at the same time. Like it actually, if you think about what it means to be present, it's actively engaging Mm. in your life. It's not sitting there as an observer or a bystander. So yeah, I think there's this misunderstanding around the word because we think it means just be happy where you are and don't want the thing that you're wanting. Yeah, yeah. And I don't think that's exactly what it means. She is Jordan Lee Dooley, uh, best-selling author of the new book, Embrace Your Almost, her first one, Own Your Everyday, Big Success. And I want to ask you about that because through your podcast, the She Podcast, and then the book comes out, mm-hmm. and of course with social media, you you have a lot of influence and intimate connection with a lot of younger women. Mm-hmm. turns out, uh, I don't know why, but we have a lot of women that listen to this show. Yeah. And, and I, you can speak to them in ways that I cannot. Mm. What are you hearing and seeing just in our current culture, this time of history? It's a unique yeah, time of history. It is. Women who are dreaming of doing something professionally, but they also have got personal lives too. Mm-hmm. I just think it would be great. Just take a couple minutes and take what's the snapshot of what you're seeing is maybe some of the problems yeah. that people are experiencing that you are helping them address. Yeah, I think one, with how quickly culture is changing and the economy is changing and things are changing with technology, with all of the all that we've lived through with lockdowns and pandemics and everything of the last two years. I feel like so many young women and women of all ages, but particularly young women who are about to have families, Mm -hmm. currently have young families, want to have a family. They're looking around at everything that's changing and the dynamics that are changing. And they're asking, what's next for me? Like, where do I go from here? And I think that something we need to normalize, and I think you talk about this quite a bit, but it really applies to women because of the the transitions and the changing seasons of life that can happen so quickly from maybe getting the first job to then getting married to then having children to now having multiple children to now I've raised children for 10 years and now they're in high school and I have this idle time and I, who am I now? I think because there's a lot of changing seasons around family, particularly, um, there's a lot of desire or a lot of times within every, like I would say on average, like every five to seven years, women often feel the need to make a shift, wow. like a pivot, a shift, maybe a total career change. Um, and, and I think for so long we've been told like you're indecisive, you're not just sticking with one thing, mm. but like in the gig, gig economy that we now have in the, just the opportunities that the internet presents, that's actually very normal. And I think that needs to be celebrated mm. because otherwise we feel like, am I just, you know, flaky and not making up my mind, but yeah. I think it's okay to feel the need to make a change as it best fits your season. That's good. Um, give me 60 seconds mm-hmm. on the new book, Embrace Your Almost. I gave him the subtitle, Find <laughs> Clarity and Contentment in the In-Between to the not quite to the Unknowns. What are you delivering for the reader here? This book is really meant to be a guide through those seasons of life where you're finding that you're not quite where you thought you'd be, mm. or you're not quite where you thought you'd be as fulfilled, you know, then or not, you're not as fulfilled as you thought you'd be. And so it's meant to say, okay, Here's a guidebook to help you find contentment where you are. Again, it's active, so it's doing things. Mm -hmm. It's not just sitting around and thinking about things. It's active contentment in the present. And also, I think when we feel like we're not quite where we want to be or things haven't quite gone our way, it's actually an opportunity to get really clear on where are we going and why are we going there? So it's contentment in in your present, and it'll also help you simultaneously find clarity in your future or for your future when you find yourself in these seasons where you're like, well, that didn't work out how I thought, or I'm not where I thought I'd be by now. Wow. And they can pre-order it at? On Amazon, or you can go to jordanleedooley.com slash EYA. That's yeah. the easiest go, place to find it. Go to it. her site. She <laughs> makes more money, candidly, if you would buy it there instead of Amazon. You know, just as an author, I want to give you a little tip. Yeah. Any go place books website. are sold. Any but, place. She's yeah. so nice. Okay, now, <laughs> coming up, our audio audience, we're going to wrap in just a moment. Our video audience, we're going to have a bonus session. And I want to tell you what we're going to talk about, because I mentioned many times on this program, almost every day, I mention the fact that if you are winning professionally, but your personal life is 
broken or mm-hmm. things are going on, that's affecting you. And if you are winning in your personal life, but work is awful, that is affecting you. You can't separate the two. And uh, this young lady, so strong, she and her husband, Matt, they've been through some hurt, some pain in the midst of all of her professional success. She's dealt with health issues. Mm-hmm. When we come back, if that's you, if you've got a certain area of your life, you've got some dreams, but you've been dealing with maybe heartbreak or some health issues, she's walked through it. She can share it in a way that most people don't understand it. Uh, she's brave. She continues to help people. She's very, very open and honest. If you don't follow her on Instagram, search her up, Jordan Lee Dooley. Uh, she's very intimate and honest and raw and is helping so many people. And we're going to break that down. She's going to encourage you. If that's you, if you're experiencing that, there is hope. So I want you to stay tuned for that, for our bonus session, for our viewing audience, for our radio and Sirius XM audience. Thank you so much for being with us. Remember this, you matter and you do have what it takes. This is the Ken Coleman Show. Press on. Thanks for listening to the Ken Coleman Show. For more, you can find the show on demand wherever you listen to podcasts and watch the show on YouTube. You can also find Ken across all social media by following at Ken Coleman. folks welcome back for our uh, viewing audience the youtubers and everybody else out there thank you so much for being with us jordan lee dooley my guest the new book embrace your almost find clarity and contentment in the in-betweens the not quite and the unknowns okay i teed it up okay <laughs> i mean i it, because it's very personal to me too stacy mm-hmm. and i tried to have a child mm-hmm. uh for seven years wow and went through it all Wow. Failed in vitro. I mean, everything. Wow. The bad news, right? And wow. I, you know, I've, I've talked to Matt about that from the dude perspective because I don't have the female perspective. Mm-hmm. But um, this has been a painful journey for you mm-hmm. in professional success. It's mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. It, this influence that just, mm-hmm. it's amazing. And yet, yeah. that's going great. Yeah. And yet, an area of your personal life, just heartbreak. Mm-hmm. Talk about how that shaped you. What, how did you move through that and allow yourself to hurt? but also to heal while also being somebody yeah. who is an influencer and, and somebody who's pointing to others at the same time. Yeah. It was um, a little bit of a hot mess at first. Of course. Um, <laughs> That's what I want people to hear. Yeah. It's not pretty. Yeah. It's not like you just have this, there's no roadmap for how you mm. navigate tragedy in your life. When we went through our losses, um, you know, it really ended up getting at first, the first time I went through a loss, I'm a go-getter. I'm like, a, oh, well that didn't work out. We're going to make that happen. How again, many, you know? how many miscarriages? Two in a row. Wow. And then I was like, I need a break. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The second one was further along. So sure. that was pretty shocking. Yeah. Um, so after the second, it was, it really was a moment for me to step back because professionally, you know, I, I, I wrote about this in the book at the end of 2019, everything had pretty much gone. I call it like the checklist, yeah. right? Like I was just like, boom, boom, boom. And I had the best selling book. I had gotten my career to where I wanted it to. I was 25 years old, felt like I was on top of the world. And then the like end of the year, mid December, find out I'm expecting, and I'm like, this was the perfect year, right? Like, ev- and it was easy. It was like no problem. <laughs> it was like kind of an accident, and I was like, well, that was easy, great. Like mm. everything's just going according to plan, and then everything blew up in my face, kind of. And what was interesting is when something like that, whether it's something, whether it's that or something else, when something in your personal life feels like it spirals out of control, it can start to feel like I, I mean, I personally felt like whatever about my about my professional life. It was like suddenly all the dreams come true and the best selling books and all the things that we think are going to bring us joy and satisfaction mm-hmm. and contentment, which can to a degree. But when something big like that and, and personal like that happens, it just suddenly felt kind of like, why am I doing all that? Mm. Like, does it matter? You know? And so it kind of made me a little bit apathetic, I would say to, toward my work. But at the same time, I think it also put me to this place where I had worked so hard, so fast for several years, mm. just trying to build stuff that I had never really paused and taken a step back and asked, is this right for me? Mm. And is everything that I'm pursuing what I need to be pursuing? Maybe there's a few things I need to prune, you know? Cause sometimes when you're in the beginning of your career, you're just saying yes to every opportunity. You're grasping for straws, you're making things happen. And it was the first time after four and a half years really of just pressing and pushing and going that I was challenged to just pause and say, what matters here? 
and what are we pursuing and why and what needs to stay and what needs to go. So it kind of became this time of self-reflection and honest evaluation and it shifted a lot of the the type of work I was doing, the amount of projects I was saying yes to and really how I was going about building everything. Mm. So the shift happens, but then I'm just curious, did it solidify make you even more concrete in the areas of the professional journey where you said, 100%. okay, now that I've assessed everything, it's you're even more emboldened, oh, 100%. more clear. Well, I think I always say adversity can lead to clarity yeah. in a way that honestly very little can. Like I think, especially even if you haven't experienced a recent adversity, when you're trying to figure out what is going to matter to me in my work, mm-hmm. re- going back to what are the hard things that I've over- overcome? What are the things that I've walked through and who is walking through that that I can support somehow, whether directly or indirectly? Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, I think it did create a lot of clarity about what am I willing to say yes to and what am I willing to say Mm -hmm. no to? Um, Who can I serve best and Mm -hmm. and how and why? And because that can get kind of jumbled, you know, as you get going and you're just doing stuff. And so, yeah, I mean, it it definitely provided a ton of clarity. And I think adversity has a really unique way of doing that. I want to ask you about the how Mm -hmm. as it relates to our own health. Mm-hmm. Because I'm guessing, I, I we know each other. We're professional mm-hmm. friends. Mm-hmm. Do you have a high motor? Are you, oh, a hundred percent. Yeah, you don't want to assume, but I, yeah. I just assume. Like, yeah, I have one too. Like, mm-hmm. full days are good for me. Mm-hmm. I get energy out of a full day. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and you've talked about this. I'm not. I'll let you decide what you would. Have, but you had some health issues related to the miscarriages. Mm-hmm. Maybe some things that were kind of pre-existing, whatever. Mm-hmm. And I'm just curious, you know, we have a lot of women listening here, whether they're working for themselves or working for somebody else and their family relies on them, you know, from an income standpoint, and then they got to be mama or wife or whatever's mm-hmm. going on there. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just curious what you've learned about when there are times where physically you just mm-hmm. can't go yeah. where you're used to going or mm-hmm. going at the rate. What did you learn about that? Yeah. You know, what was interesting is I don't think that this necessarily caused issues. There were some other things too, but one thing I did uncover in the process of, cause I kind of went crazy. I was like, I, I like take, I have taken like stacks of testing and paper, like results to doctors. I'm like, so explain this. They're like, you've already had all this (laughs) testing done. I'm like, yes, I want to understand. Um, but one of the things we uncovered in the process was I had like so many, I mean, underactive thyroid and my adrenals were just tapped. And like, basically it was just, my body was operating in such a like state of sustained stress for so long that it was kind of like, I'm done. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I was chronically fatigued, relying on caffeine. Like it was, I was 25 years old. I had no natural energy. Like something's wrong with that. Um, and honestly it shouldn't even really matter your age. If you don't have any natural energy, that's That's a concern. And so anyways, it's, it kind of led to this, okay, how am I going to still work, but work well, Mm. work at a sustainable pace? And what do I need to be doing to make sure that I am actually nourishing and supporting my body? I look back three, four years ago, I would like work straight through lunch just because I didn't really feel hungry. And also if you don't have an appetite, that's a problem. That's like, I could get into all the like sciencey wellness stuff, but I won't. Uh But my point is like, be aware of those things. Mm. Like if you're not getting, if you don't have natural energy, if you're eating or skipping lunch just Mm -hmm. because you're working straight through it, if you're up late at night on a tablet or a cell phone, like that's all messing with your Mm -hmm. circadian rhythm. Like you've got to make sure that you're preserving your mental health and your physical health and nourishing yourself and setting boundaries and do it because otherwise, like, I mean, again, I don't necessarily think that it was a cause, but it was interesting to uncover how burned out my body physically was. And it made sense why I was feeling that so much mentally. Yeah. Which affects your ability to be the best version of you. And to actually show up well. And and that's, I think, why, like, uh, one of the big signs of burnout is feeling a dissatisfactory sense of um, kind of, like, disconnected Mm -hmm. from something that once really you that you once really cared about like i love my work mm-hmm. i really think i couldn't think of a better fit for what i get to do with my life and all of a sudden there was a while there where i just felt mm-hmm. disinterested yeah. it was just like mm. yeah you know that's what um, i want people to hear yeah. the tragedy when mm-hmm. you when you're physically not well mm-hmm. is it begins to rob you yeah of all of the beauty that you love and that you want to put into this yes. world. I mean, it will shut you down. Yeah, you'll all of a sudden feel very apathetic about the thing that you were actually born to do, and then you're going to get really confused. Yes. Because you're like, wait, I thought this was it. Wow. Right? So there's that. I had to navigate a lot of that. But yeah, I mean, and here's the thing I think that's really important to know. If you have gone through something hard, um, burnout is not only caused by working hard that's or right. too working too much. It can also be caused by grief, yes. by big life changes. Mm-hmm. And if you put a few of those things together in a short period of time, like you yeah. just got married, moved across the country, experienced a tragedy and you're hustling your butt off. Yeah. Yeah. It's literally you're like, like heading for disaster. <laughs> it, you know what it is? It's like the emotional and psychological mm-hmm. version of that, that goofy show Wipeout, mm-hmm. where they run and it's like something's beating on them and hitting me or yeah. bouncing off. It feels like that. And it, uh, it can be a real problem. Well, folks, yeah. now, you know, 
just a little bit of what I know and why she is such a <laughs> gift. Jordan Lee Dooley. Uh, the book is Embrace Your Almost, Find Clarity and Contentment in the In-Betweens, Not Quite and Unknowns. It's available for pre-order now. You can get it wherever books are sold. I highly recommend the She Podcast. I also recommend you follow her on social media. She's really putting a lot of good stuff out in the world, and she brings a, a unique perspective. So, I mean, I would just tell you, any lady, dudes as well, but certainly any lady, any age, um, she's doing some incredible work and can show you some things that I think are so unique and, and you're doing great work. And I've told you thank that you. before. Thank you for your friendship. Thanks for having me on and thank your you. program. Uh, but more importantly, thank you for joining arms in arms with me on this, this idea of a unique contribution. Yeah. And you're Absolutely. doing good work. Well, so excited. You. Congratulations on the book. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It's awesome. been really fun. All right. My time is almost up, but remember this, you matter. You do have what it takes. And the world needs it, so go do it. This is The Ken Coleman Show. Press on.